to have a copy of God's Word. Uh, the Bible that is, that's the only place where uh, God's Word is to be found in these days in which we live. This is the New Testament, the uh, second part of the Bible in its entirety and offered to you uh, freely uh, without any cost, any obligation to you. If you would like one, then do feel free to come and ask for one. One of God uh, given to us, uh, to reveal to us the knowledge of God, and of course of ourselves, uh, what it is that we are in truth, and of course uh, where we are in respect to God. And that, of course, as the Bible informs us, is far, far away from him. Uh, you would like a copy of God's Word, instruct you, inform you as to the way back to God from sin's dark path, then uh, it is offered to you uh, quite freely, yours for the taking. Do it as you will. Like one, place it into your hand. In the Bible, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, uh, prior to his uh, uh, resurrection and, uh, and departure, uh, he declared that, um, well, that his work, the gospel, that is the good news, uh, concerning himself was to be uh, declared in all the world repentance, remission of sins, that is forgiveness, which of course is what uh, the gospel, the Bible, really in its entirety is, uh, is all about. How that a man or woman can be uh, repaired, that is uh, restored uh, to God's favor. Must needs be because uh, we are out of favor. We are conceived, the Bible says, we are born in sin, and therefore we are, all of us, children of wrath, naturally speaking, under the holy displeasure of God. And the only way, of course, uh, by which uh, we can be restored to God's favor is by the gospel that I come to declare to you again here this afternoon. That, that repentance uh, for the remission of sins that Jesus uh, spoke about uh, might be uh, declared amongst you here this afternoon. For without that repentance, without that change of mind, change of heart, change of direction, well, of course, there can be no way back to God. But the gospel is content being Jesus himself and, of course, his work not yours, not mine, his death, that is, and resurrection, the gospel, the good news, the very good news concerning God's salvation, the only way back to God from sin's dark path. Of course, for the, uh, uh, the Christian, you know, there's uh, a lot of questions, of course, that people have concerning life and what it holds for them. Life and death, you know. If a thing has a beginning, well then it must needs have an end. The world in the beginning, it will have an end. The Bible tells us so, and how that will happen. Life is the beginning, and it will have an end. That's the one sure thing that you're guaranteed. The only thing that you can guarantee, and that is that one day you'll put your socks on in the morning, but the undertaker will take them off at night. Maybe this will be this day for you, I don't know. Uh, that's why, well, another reason why you need to uh, get right with God. The one thing that you can guarantee, as doubtless many of you, especially you youngsters, prepare for life. You want to be rocket scientists. You want to be doctors, you want to be nurses, and you train and you work to prepare for life, 
But of course, all these things might not happen. There might be disappointment. There might be illness, poverty. All kinds of things can come in the way of your future plans for life. But, friends, the one thing that you can guarantee is that one day you're going to die. And uh, maybe that's what you should be preparing for above all else. It is appointed, the Bible says, it is appointed for man wants to die. After that comes the judgment. So you see, more important, I think, that you be ready for that which you can most certainly guarantee. But what would uh, be a comfort to you? You know, in both life and all that it has to throw at you, and of course death when it comes inevitably. I mean, perhaps imagine for a moment you were on your deathbed and life was ebbing from you. What would be a comfort for you? Maybe perhaps you could draw your money out the bank, get it all in coins, and you could play with it there on your deathbed. Would that comfort you? Or perhaps maybe you could think about all the exotic places you've been, or maybe all the sin that you've enjoyed. Would that bring you comfort, do you think, at such a time as that? I think not. No, for the Christian, you see, they have life. They have in both life and death, however it comes to them, in whatever shape, size it comes to them, they have comfort in life and death. In this, of course, that, well, they belong to their faithful Savior the one who has promised them salvation, forgiveness, remission of sin, that repentance uh, for remission of sins that Jesus spoke about that was to be declared in all the world. They, of course, they have the comfort of knowing that they belong to Jesus. And of course, well, that's the safest place that anybody can be in all the universe. I mean, we live in a very dangerous world, don't we? Terrorism and uh, disease and famine and, well, who knows when it will come to you or I. You know, it's it's a very dangerous world, you know. There's, well, there's no safe place you can go. I mean, you can emigrate to Australia, but I think you find it just the same there, just as dangerous, maybe even more so. But America, South America, It doesn't matter where you go in the world, you'll find the same issues. You'll find the same fallen, sinful, wicked, evil men and women. Same all over. But you see, the Christian belongs to Jesus, their faithful Savior. And so therefore, you see, they are safe and secure in the arms of Jesus. They've trusted in Him, and He is their faithful Savior. And of course, they live with the the comfort in both life and death, you know, that his blood shed in the cross. Satisfaction has been made for their sins. That is, the justice of God has been satisfied. The price has been paid. But Jesus came for, don't you know? He was uh, born into this world to die, to die on a cross, you see, appointed for this. He declared, Uh, to his disciples, he says in God's word in the Bible, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it again. And that's exactly what he did. He laid it down. He died on that cross according to the determinate will and purpose of God in order that God's people, God's elect, God's chosen from before the foundation of the world might be gathered to him might receive that remission of sin in the way of repentance and faith towards the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So they know that their sins have been dealt with, you see. The Christian, I mean, the person who believes, not the unbeliever, the person who has repented, the person who has received remission of sin. Their sin is dealt with. So they have this great comfort, you see, in life and death, whatever it has to throw at them. And of course, they have the assurance 
that they've been delivered from the power of the devil. You know, the Bible talks about those who are in unbelief, how that they are held in the snare of the devil. And if you know anything about snares, well, when an animal gets caught in a snare, the more and more it struggles, the tighter, the tighter the snare becomes and begins to choke the very life out of them until it kills them. Oh, here you are in your unbelief, you see. You're in the snare of the devil. And the more you struggle and try to be free, well, the tighter the snare becomes, the more he grips you. Only one person who can break that snare, set you free, of course, is Jesus Christ. It's through my gospel my Savior, my Jesus, who died for sinners, who uh, died to deliver them from the power of darkness and evil. Then, of course, uh, well, the Christian, too, has this comfort in both life and death, that, uh, that Jesus Christ preserves them, keeps them, and assures them of eternal life. I give unto them his sheep, that is, my sheep who hear my voice. Maybe perhaps you don't hear the voice of Jesus today uh, simply because you're not one of his sheep. I don't know. But he says, my sheep, they hear my voice, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Many, many other such wonderful and gracious promises are given to comfort and to console the believing, the Christian man or woman, as they travel through this life with all its afflictions and difficulties. Because we don't escape them any more than you do, but we do have comfort. We do have the comfort of a Savior, a faithful Savior, who preserves and assures us of eternal life. So what is it that a person needs to know in order to obtain this comfort. I mean, should you wish to have such comfort in life and death? I mean, whatever your situation is now, I don't know. Maybe it's rosy, maybe everything's happy, you know, and, and good with you. You know, rosy in the garden, as they say. But will it be that way always? I don't think so. The afflictions, the trouble will come, the sicknesses, the pain, the aging and, you know, all that stuff. And then that's not the end. Finally, you've got the ignominy of death. And even that's not the end. Because after that, if you have not believed, if you have not repented and believed the gospel, well, then, then you're faced with the judgment of God. So you see, not even death brings it to an end. Some people reckon, you know, they've made a covenant with death. You know, that they're quite happy with it. They delude themselves. You know, that death will be the end. That will be the finish of it. No more suffering, no more pain, no more afflictions, no more torment. Now, your suffering will only just have begun if you have not believed on the only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who demands of his people in every day and generation that, re that repentance should be preached, should be declared in all the world for remission of sins. So God now commanded all men everywhere to repent. Jesus demands it, commands it of you. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So what things, what knowledge, what, what things is it? You know, it's a need to know basis, you know? Without knowledge, a person cannot have faith, and without faith, a person cannot be saved. You need to know, you see. And how shall you know? Well, says the Bible, unless the preacher comes and tells you. How will you know what to believe? Because most of you, I, I would guess, I think it would be a safe bet. You know, if I were a betting man, I'm not, but if I were, it would be a safe bet to say, that the majority of you are without a scrap of knowledge concerning these things, concerning the gospel, concerning salvation, 
I mean, do you even know what the word repent means? It means a change of mind, a change of heart, leading to a change of direction, leading to obedience to the gospel of God's Son, Jesus Christ. So what things is it that a person needs to know in order to have this comfort in both life and death? Well, there are three things that you need to know. And the first of them is, you need to know how great your sins are and how great your miseries are. You know that saying you have amongst you? She's as miserable as sin. Uh, why go you about miserable all the day long? Ask yourself the question. Oh, you see, I just want to be happy. I said, that's all we need, just be happy. Well, why don't you be happy? Huh? Where is this elusive happiness and where do you find it? At the bottom of the next can of lager? Huh? After the next sexual fix in some sexual deviance or something? Where is this elusive happiness that I hear you talking about but you never seem to achieve, you never seem to attain to. No, misery follows you hard on your heels every day of your life. You don't spend many days, you don't spend many hours in happiness if you're really honest with yourself. And you know why that is? Do you know what causes the misery? It's your sin. And no, not just the things that you do, yeah, that's bad enough, but because you're conceived in sin, born in sin, and therefore a child of wrath, under the holy displeasure of God, right from the moment of conception. That's where life begins. You know this argument that we have with these murdering abortionists? Oh, they say it's not really life. Yes, it is. God says you're conceived in sin, and so to be a sinner, you have to be a person. So at the moment of conception, that's where your sin life begins. That's where life begins. So that turns abortion into wholesale murder, slaughter. But then, of course, that, well, that's not my point. That was a, a bit of a, di a, a digression. Forgive me. But you see, the misery is caused by the sin, the sin nature. So you come into the world, you see a rebel against God. You come into the world shaped in an iniquity that is shaped in rebellion with your face in your, your, face in your maker's face, living in defiance of him right from the get-go. And that never comes to an end. You live your life, your whole, the entirety of your life that way in defiance against your maker, in denial of him and in defiance of him. And so therefore, you live in misery and you have no comfort in life and death, none whatsoever, until you come to know you need this knowledge. So how does a person come to a knowledge of the, the greatness of their sin? Well, God's word, the gospel, you see, the gospel, the good news, the word of God, the Bible in its entirety, the law by the, the law is the knowledge of sin, says God. You turn to the commandments of God, there's only 10 of them, it won't take you very long to read them, Exodus chapter 20, second book of the Bible, and see there, thou shalt have no other gods before me, only God, the true and living God, to worship him, not yourself, not the, not the gods of this age, not the idols of the world, but God himself in Jesus Christ. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not kill, and so on. All of these transgressions, all of these lawless deeds contrary to the law of God, they come from a sinful nature. Bible, you see the revelation of God, what God is truly like, awesomely holy, burning with holiness. And you are the exact opposite, contrary to God, in your nature and your practice. The distance between you and God is eternal. 
And so you see the need for this repentance that leads to the remission of sin, that leads to the forgiveness of sin. But you must needs first come to a knowledge, to know the greatness of your sin. God is holy. Oh, you hear people, I hear them myself, going about telling you, oh, God is love, you know. Oh, they know that verse. But that's about the only one that they know. God is love, God is love, you know. Like he's a, a white-bearded old gentleman who sits on the edge of a cloud up there just waiting, waiting, waiting on you, you know, to ooze out forgiveness just when it suits you. That's not quite, that's not quite the revelation of God in the Bible. Awesomely bristling with holiness and with indignation against the sins of the world angry with the wicked every day every day you walk under the cloud of god's wrath it burns against you in holiness great are your sins they are vast in number but they are enormous enormous against a holy and righteous god so what will he do with you if your sin is not dealt with if you do not even come to a knowledge, knowing it, knowing what causes your utter and absolute misery and without any comfort, either in life or in death. No, you must needs come to a knowledge of what it is you really are and not the cruel dude that you see in the mirror on the wall that tells you each and every morning you're the fairest of them all. That's not reality. And of course, well, if you were honest, you know it. No, the mirror on the wall only gives you an outward reflection of your outward self. It doesn't reveal your heart. It's the mirror of God's law that reveals your heart condition. Deceitful and desperately wicked, says God. That's the reality. Every, every man woman and child in this world and so therefore friends separated from God as a result of your iniquities your rebellion against God little wonder you're so misery miserable all the day long little wonder there's no happiness lasting happiness with you what right I ask you do you have to happiness to comfort and consolation when you're so sinful, so unbelieving. Little wonder, little wonder there's no happiness with you. Angry, blazing mad as soon as God is mentioned, even his salvation, his loving kindness drives you insane. Raging against the Almighty. But I'll tell you what he'll do with you if your sins are not forgiven, if your sins are not remitted, not sent away by Jesus, your sin will take you away and it will take you someplace, believe me, you do not want to go. Yeah, I, 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 I hear the youngsters, oh yeah, that's where I want to go. Party with my friends, do the drugs and all the rest of it, you know. That'll be great. No, it won't. You'll be more lonely, more miserable than you ever imagined you could possibly be. Eternal, eternal torments for all eternity. If your sins are not remitted, if they're not sent away, if you're not forgiven, and only one person who can remit your sin, only one person who can send it away, only one person who can forgive you, Son of Man alone has authority on earth to forgive sins. No Pope, no priest, no Allah, no, Mu no, no Muhammad, no Buddha, no Confucius, nobody but Jesus has the authority, has the power to say to anyone, thy sins be forgiven thee. So that's the first point of knowledge. You must need to uh, come to know the greatness of your sin and the greatness of your misery in order that, that is to obtain this comfort in both life and death. 
which of course, yeah, well, are guaranteed. Well, the lots are at least anyway. But then the second thing is that, uh, well, you need to know, you must need to know how to be delivered from your great sins and your great misery. And once again, I think I would be on safe ground if I was to say that 99.9% .9 of you here in Stafford Town this afternoon would not have a clue. Uh, maybe perhaps you would come out with the mantra that God is love, loves everybody, accepts everybody. Or maybe you would come out with the other mantra, well, I'm a good person, God ought to accept me. Well, are you going to heaven? There's the question. Would you like to take the test? The test is quite a simple one. How many lies have you told in your life? A thousand? Ten thousand? Maybe ten million? Maybe you're a living liar. What do you call a person who tells lies? You call them a liar. Oh, no liar shall enter heaven, says God. Have uh, you ever stolen anything, big or small? It doesn't matter. What do you call somebody who steals? You call them thieves. No thief shall ever enter my heaven, says God. You ever lusted after the opposite, or maybe even today the same sex? Well, nothing unclean, nothing immoral shall enter my heaven, says God. So there you are, you're not going to heaven after all. You're not a good person after all. You're a bad person, quite a bad person. In fact, a very bad, a wicked person. There's none good, says God, none that doeth good, none righteous, not a single one. All who sinned and come short of the glory of God. Not a man that sinneth not. So the question is though, how do you get delivered from that state and condition? Conceived and born in sin, a child of wrath. That's your status right from the get-go. So how do you get your status changed? How do you get right with God? How do you get justified? How do you get delivered from the greatness of your sins and misery? How do you get delivered? Well, that's why Jesus came. Made of a woman made under the law to pay the penalty of the law, born to die. And that's exactly what he did. Fulfilled, accomplished everything his father gave him to do. He, uh, if you like, stepped up to the plate, you know. Uh, thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? Because that name means Savior. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. You are his people, those who will believe in his name. For God so loved the world is not an invitation, it's a declaration that God loved. You know, God sent his son, Jesus Christ. God so loved the world, you know, not, not just Jews, not just the Old Testament Israel, but, I just thank you, sir. Thank you. Very, very good, very good. Blessing to see. Okay, thank you, sir. God bless you. Keep going, God bless you. Thank you. So you see that, that that means John 3 16 it's the most abused verse in all the Bible I tell you it's not an invitation it's a declaration Jesus had just been talking to a Jewish teacher you know telling him that he needed to be born again and he didn't understand what Jesus meant you know they thought that you know that that God was just for the Jews no no now God so loved the world, people from the four corners of the world, whosoever believeth, believers from the four corners of the world, Jews and Gentiles alike. See friends, uh, Jesus Christ came into the world to fulfill, to accomplish his Father's will to do that which the law of God, the commandments of God, could not do, religion could not do, you could not do. When we were that strength, Christ died for the ungodly. A person, Jesus, not a religion, and what did he do? He died. That's where the deliverance comes from. That's 
how you get delivered from the greatness of your sin and misery and get the comfort of both life and death by trusting in the death of another, by trusting in the righteousness of another. Because here's the thing, you stand before God in that day, <laughs> trusting in your own righteousness, you're going to be shot to pieces. You don't have a leg to stand on. You need the righteousness of another. You need the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel. Jesus Christ, his righteousness. That's how you get delivered by his dying, not your being religious, not your trying to be good, not your being nice, you know? Now, some of you are nice people. The nice people need saving as well as not nice people. Everybody needs to be saved. Whatever kind of, ever strife or sinner you might be, from a murderer to a gossip, unless you're washed in the blood of the Lamb, and trusting in the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel. In that day, you will not have a leg to stand on. Blown away in the judgment of Almighty God. Friends, sinners to a man, to a woman, all of it. So it's no, no great wonder, is it, to know that there's not much comfort, <coughs> not much consolation with you, you know, in life and death, you know, when the hard stuff comes to you, it's not long before it comes. For some, it even comes in childhood. Some, it comes in the teens. Some, it's later in life, but it comes. You can guarantee it, the afflictions. The pain, the suffering, it comes in all shapes and sizes. So where would you find comfort in life and death? Well, only in a faithful Savior, only the one who died, who shed his blood for sins that you might be washed and made clean. That by trusting in him that you might be delivered from the power of the evil one. That you might be delivered from the darkness. And that you might be brought into God's marvelous light. And that you might know that you belong to God. That you might live knowing that even were the universe to disintegrate and fall apart, you would still be safe in the arms of Jesus. There is no other safe place in all the world, I tell you. It's a dangerous, dangerous world. And in the arms of Jesus is the only safe place to be, I tell you. It's to him that you must go, because only he can deal with the misery. Because he alone can deal with the sin. It's the sin that causes the misery. All the time, you know, you want to be dealing, you want to be dealing with the effects, you know. Give me a drink, you know, give me some alcohol, get rid of this misery. But it doesn't, only does it transiently, doesn't it, you know. Only does it for a short while, you know. Get rid of this misery, give me a drug fix, eh. Get rid of this misery, you know. Give me some kind of sexual experience, you know. Get rid of the misery. Get rid of the cause, then you get rid of the effect. The cause is the sin. The effect is the misery. Deal with the cause, not the effect. So who can deal with the cause? Well, you need to go to Jesus because only he can deal with it. Only Jesus can deliver you from it. He alone died for sinners. He alone died for the ungodly, nobody else. Theresa May didn't do that for you. Granny Merkel didn't do it for you. The United Nations didn't do it for you. Pope didn't do it for you. Mohammed didn't do it for you. They just dead sinners like the rest. Friends, you need to be born again. You need to be regenerated by the sovereign power of God. You need to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Whatever stripe or sinner you might be, respectable or disrespectable, it doesn't matter, yeah? Nothing worse than respectable religion, you know? That external religion, a covering, you know? Making yourself look like you're good, when inside you're rotten, 
You're like dead men's bones in sight. Friends, whatever you are, I tell you, you need to be washed in the blood of Jesus because until you are, you are totally unacceptable to God. But in his beloved son, you can and will be accepted if you will believe, if you will trust in him. And to trust in him means to obey him. Both words are the same. If you trust me, you will obey me, Jesus said. If you don't obey, if you don't obey him, then obviously you do not trust him. You trust in somebody, you do what they say. You trust your mom and dad, you do what mom and dad says. If you don't do what they say, well, it's because you don't trust them. Trust in me, says Jesus. I'll deliver you. I'll deliver you from your sin, from its misery, and of course, give you that comfort in both life and death that we all of us need. Then the third thing, of course, that we need, third item of knowledge that we need is how, having received such comfort, how do I express my gratitude to God? Well, it seems to me that this is, uh, this is what's missing um, in churches throughout the land today. This expression of gratitude, you see, salvation leads to a change, oh, a mega change. You start uh, not just believing, but you start behaving. Because there are two sides to the gospel coin. And one side is believing, and then the other side is behaving. You start to live your life in gratitude to, for God, you know. You stop gratifying your sinful lusts, you know. Uh, you stop... Uh, you know, you, you've come to the realization you belong to God and the realization that the universe is God's and everything in it, you know, and that the universe doesn't revolve around you after all, but actually it revolves around God. It's all for Him, for His Son and for His glory. He made it and He made it for Himself, for His own glory. So you see, the person who has received this comfort who has comfort in both life and death is a person who expresses their gratitude to God in this way, in obedience to God's commandments, living a life that's pleasing to God and not just simply and only pleasing to themselves. That's how you express gratitude to God for his goodness, his kindness and mercy. And in doing so, you wait for his son from heaven, who's coming again, the Bible says, with his holy angels from heaven in flaming fire to take vengeance upon all those who do not know God and who obey not the gospel. That is, those who have not trusted, those who have not obeyed Jesus, those who do not know God not just being religious, it's knowing God, knowing Him personally, relationally. It's God, you see, coming by His power and placing His life into the soul of a man or woman. It's God coming and placing His love into the hearts of men and women. That's what it means to be born again. Everything changes. The nature changes. The desires change desire and love for God, for holiness, for his word, for his son, for heaven. The old desires, you know, for the hellish lifestyle, the unbelieving wickedness of the world, all that changes. Everything is thrust into reverse gear. And now you live a life of gratitude, extreme gratitude to God for his goodness and kindness in giving you such a savior, for that you belong to such a faithful savior who has made satisfaction for your sins and delivered you from the devil, from the evil one, and preserves you, keeps you, and assures you of eternal life. 
that is for those who believe. That whosoever believeth shall have everlasting life and not perish. But unbelievers perish. Unbelievers go out of this world. They live in torment. They live in misery. They live in their sin. And they die in their sin. And they go out of this world in their sin. And they go to hell in their sin. That's the end of your unbelief. That's the end of your sinful pleasures now. Enjoy them while you can. But it's not going to last. It's not going to last. Don't believe you won't be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, says God. But believe not and thou shalt not be saved. It's that simple. Faith is what's required of you. Knowledge that leads to faith, you see. The knowledge is given to you of these things. How great your sins and their misery are how you may be delivered from them, how you may express gratitude to God for deliverance. This knowledge is imparted to you in order that you might be led to faith, to trust in Jesus, to believe in Jesus, that you might have comfort in life and death. So do you have this comfort in life and death? If death were to come stalking you this very night, would you be comfortable with it? Would you be pleased to go with them if the grim reaper comes to you, knocking your door this very night, saying to you, come, 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 your time is up? Would you be comfortable, happy with it, willing to go with him? Or would you be stricken with terror, absolute terror? Well, you may have comfort, in both life and death, if that is you belong to Jesus, that is if you trust in him, that is if you believe in his name, because he gives, he gives to his own, he gives them eternal life. Only to these who believe, only to those who trust, only to those who obey, do they, do they have the, re the repentance that leads to remission of sin. Have your sins been treated? Have they been dealt with? Only Jesus can. Go to him. Believe on him. That's the command. God's command today. Commands all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere. Commands all men to believe. If you don't believe, you won't be saved. Your, your, your responsibility, your fault, your blame, not God. God's provided the means. His son is only begotten, crucified, dead, buried, and raised again from the dead. You don't believe, you'll not be saved. But God commands faith, commands you to believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, and he promises thou shalt be saved. Repent ye and believe the gospel, says Jesus. Repent ye and believe the gospel, Stafford, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's why. Repent ye and believe the gospel, the good news. Salvation in the name of Jesus Christ who commands and demands that repentance leading to remission of sin should be preached in all the world even in Stafford Town. Some, some, one may be, may turn and believe and be saved. You'd like to have a copy of God's Word and inform yourself further concerning these things. It's offered to you freely. No cost, no obligation to you. Yours for the taking. Quite freely. The Word of God able to make you wise for salvation. You'd like a copy of God's Word, you come and ask for one. May God bless you and have mercy upon your precious, precious, never-dying soul.